case of China, for example, if they, there is something happening in Tianmen, I mean, the whole world media is focused on that, and something happens in India. I mean, it's a, because it's a clock of democracy there, so therefore th there is no pinpointing of, these, uh, of the Indians in that direction. George, do, do elected leaders in these rogue democracies, as Barbara points out, uh, use uh, forms of democracy as political wool to pull over the eyes of those living abroad? Oh, of course. Uh, if, if you're going to deal with uh, the Western world, uh, then you have to have... Uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, your, your diploma, so to speak, to be able to sit at the table of Western uh, society, and that is uh, to be a democracy and represent a democracy. So, of course, uh, these officials uh, present themselves as being elected officials of democratic states. They may be imperfect states, but I think they're, they're certainly representative of one sort or another of a part of their uh, society. And uh, in that respect, uh, in a competitive election, uh, I would give them the benefit of the doubt. But uh, an imperfect state in many cases, absolutely. I've seen a lot of them, not just uh, uh, in uh, sub-Asian continent, Eastern Europe. Human rights records of many of these rogue democracies clearly fall short of uh, international, humans, uh, international standards. Uh, um, but they don't raise eyebrows because uh, let's listen in to Barbara for a minute. This comes back to your very first question. This is a democracy. Can you imagine a big democracy where that many people would be killed, singled out for their religion, and that nobody would pay the price? A government would fall. Something would happen. There would be impeachment proceedings, but nothing happened, nothing. And I think this is what... Um, of course, the Kashmiri people are also experiencing in a different way, on a different scale for other reasons. Um, by the way, I might say on Kashmiri,